Go back into Ephesians chapter 4. We're, we're really finished with that and I'm going to take you back over to Galatians. Now you didn't lose the, the impact of what I said earlier, right? Out of Galatians? Okay. And then out of Ephesians, who you are? That's why I keep emphasizing. It's not what you know. You know, it's not a new doctrine that gets the sick healed. It's knowing who you are. It's knowing what God... So that's the important thing. Now, we finished up in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. that says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, let's go on down a little bit. There's a couple of other verses I'm going to read to you real, real quickly. Verse 16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. So we're talking about the body kneading itself and each part of the body has a, is a part. <clears throat> According to the effective or effectual working in the measure of every part. So see, it's important that your part be working right. Right? And that way you are contributing to the body the fullness of your potential and what God needs to come from you. Now, in Ephesians, you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians 3, verse 20, it says, According as God, or, or who God is able to, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask, according to the power that works in you. Well, this is that power he's talking about here, the effectual working of each part. You've got to have that part working in you and walking in fullness. See, it's not just enough to be born again and go to church and say, I'm here and I'm paying my tithes and I'm doing whatever. And because I'm here, I'm contributing my part. That's not contributing your part. Contributing your part is you walking in the fullness and having the power of God working in you so that you are actually contributing something to the overall body by doing and being who God intended you to be. Amen? Is that, I know it's a mouthful there, but okay. Now, it says, <clears throat> Making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Now, he says, because of all that, I'm saying this. Now, watch this. That you, henceforth, from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You hear? You are not to walk like other Gentiles in the vanity of your mind, meaning making big, all this stuff, which, honestly, that verse right now, really exemplifies the church as I see it around across the United States and not so much around the world as much as around the United States. The church in the United States is mostly walking in the vanity of their mind. If, if one-tenth of what churches claim is done in a church service was actually done, America would be a different nation. Right? Because they go, oh, we're pulling down strongholds. Oh, we're pulling down principalities. And we're going to... You go out, and the funny thing is that the city is not different one bit. Right? So there is a problem there. We're, the Bible says, He that, <clears throat> he that, uh, what is it? Yeah, he that claims, let me get the right translation here. Yeah, he that claims a gift he does not have is like clouds and wind without rain. Okay? that's the church. Basically what it is, you, know, you say, well, what do mean clouds and wind without rain? Back in the old days, when they would see a storm coming up, it didn't bother them. They were glad because it meant rain. Rain meant life. It meant things grow. It meant good. Okay? And he said, look, when you, or if a, if a, well, actually I think what it says, if a man boasts boast of a gift, that's what it says, if a man boasts of a gift that he does not possess or does not have, then he's like clouds and wind without rain. That means if a man or especially in the body of Christ today, if we claim something that we don't have, we, we're like clouds and wind without any life. In other words, we can, clouds and wind, what does that mean? We can put on a big show, we can have a lot of noise, but when it comes down to it, you can't produce anything. Well, if that's not the church today, I don't know what is. So we have to get back to the reality to be able to produce what we claim. Amen? It's not enough to stand up and go, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prophetically do this, and this is a, a prophetic act. Okay, prophetic acts are supposed to have practical application. Right? And they're actually supposed to do something, to change something. 
The Bible says that what you see on earth is what's taking place in the heavens. Well, if you're claiming to be doing things prophetically in the spirit realm, then we ought to see the results of it on earth. All right? Now, he says, not walking like other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. In other words, that's not the way you're supposed to be acting. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now listen to this. That you put off concerning the former lifestyle. That word conversation means lifestyle. The old man. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man. Which. Now he's, to, he's going to tell you what this new man is. Which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. You hear that? The new man you're supposed to be putting on is, is created after Christ or after God in righteousness and holiness. In other words, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to put off this old man and you put on this new man and the new man is going to look and talk and act like God. You understand? He says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, sin not. Let your son not go down. Let, yeah, let the son not go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor. Working with his hands that which is good. Now watch this. That he may have to give to him that needs. You hear that? <clears throat> the reason you work shouldn't be so you can stockpile. It should be so that you have to give to someone who needs. Now, if you had everything you needed, would you still go to work just so you could make some money to give to somebody else that was in need? Because that should be the that should be the reason you go to work. Now think about that. Okay? Now watch. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. We say, how do you do that? Well, he's telling you. Part of it is letting corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness. Now see, he's still talking about some conversation here. And wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. The word followers is, Im uh, is actually the Greek word mimetes. And it means to follow or to imitate. And we're, it's where we get the word mimic. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us as an offering, sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And he goes on and says, let all these things stop. Don't do it. It, it, you, sometime you are just going to just read Ephesians. There's a lot in there, but don't just read through it like you're reading a novel. Take it, read each verse. Say, what is that saying? If you don't know, look up each word. But get an understanding of what it is. The word of God you don't understand does not help you. And the words you don't understand, the enemy will steal from you. Right? So you must understand it. Now, go with me back over to Galatians. <clears throat> Galatians. <clears throat> we stopped a while ago at verse 1 of chapter 4. Remember that's whenever I read and said, Now I say that the heir... Who's the heir? Uh, did y'all lose it over lunch? Who's the heir? You're the heir. Okay. The heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he, the heir, be lord of all. Now watch, he's going to, now he's going to talk about this, this Lord of all heir that's under a servant. Or acts as a servant. This heir is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. 
Now, that time appointed is not a set time, meaning a day or year. He's saying until the Father basically says, okay, that's enough. Right? It wasn't a set time. Do you know how they used to train royalty? Have you all heard that? How they trained royalty? Okay. When a king wanted his son, the prince, to be trained, to be groomed, to be put into position as the next king, then they had to have tutors. Well, the tutors were of a less rank than the prince, right? Because the only person over a prince was a king. So the king would have to hire tutors that were actually less ranked than the person they were training, right? And because of that, they couldn't tell the prince, don't do that, don't do that. If you do that, I'm going to punish you. Because if you talk to a prince like that, that was it. Even though you were his teacher, you couldn't talk to him. So you know how they had to teach them? The tutors had to learn the language of instruction. And a tutor taught a prince this way. They would say, uh, when they caught the prince doing something wrong, they'd say, oh, wait, 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 look. We don't do that because kings don't act that way. You hear what I'm saying? He didn't get on to him, didn't scold him, didn't badger him or point the finger or yell at him. He said, no, 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 look, we don't do that because kings don't act that way. You're a future king. You've got to act like a king. Right. Now, see, if you read that, if you understand that, you ought to read, when you read books, read like that. Right? The only books I've ever found that read kind of like that is E.W. Kenyon. He's the only one that, that wrote that way, that I know of. I'm, maybe there's others, but I'm saying he's the only one that, that wrote like that. But you have to... <clears throat> a lot of the way that I teach comes across very blunt and, and even brash sometimes and some, sometimes people think I'm rude or, or harsh or that kind of thing. Now, I will tell you why I do that. Because that, if, if we talk, you know, if we go somewhere and eat and talk and sit, and, you're going to find out that's really not my personality. Right? I don't want to hurt anybody. And really my personality, I'm soft-spoken and, you know, I think I'm easy to get along with. I'm sure somebody disagree. But the reason... I do this, and I'm not saying I put on anything from the public, because I don't. But the message in the beginning, most people are religiously asleep. And I have to be able to wake them. And usually, if I don't say it in a manner that will shock you, you won't even hear it. Because you'll think, I'm just preaching. All right? I'm not just preaching. I never really wanted to be a preacher. I could care less about preaching. All I know is I found some things that work. And, I, and now, used to, it was just about sharing them. But now it's beyond that because now it is a matter of I've got to get them to you because it's not even about you anymore. It's about those people out there that want help and need help and nobody can get to them. And so if I, you know, if I come across harsh... It's not because I'm mad at you or that I know you or you've done something wrong. It's not that at all. But I'm trying to break through the religious crust that has formed through possibly years of just religious, you know, listening to religious preaching. So I don't, and the things I say, I never mean to say something that will hurt or put people in condemnation. Hopefully what I preach might point out the, the problem but it should also point you to the way out. All right? And what to do. Amen? So that's why I preach the way I do. Now, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm, well, in the Bible school, things are going to be somewhat different, you know, in some ways. I mean, the, the same message and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to spend time with the people that come there to work with them. All right? We go on the streets. We do things on the streets. It's much more hands-on and that kind of stuff. So, I want you to understand, and even some of the other materials we have in there, you'll see, it's still blunt. But it's also because usually what people call blunt means direct. Right? I don't have time to code it. We don't have time. I'm not here long enough. So I have to say it straightforward. 
And many times you're not used to straightforward preaching. You're used to somebody saying it every way but the way they mean it, hoping you'll get it. I don't do that. I say it, I try to say it in sentences. If I ever finish sentences, I try to finish those sentences in direct ways that will cause you to see exactly so there's no mistake and no misunderstanding. Amen? You may not like me, but you know exactly where I stand. Okay? Now, Galatians 4, 3. Even so we, when we were children. Now watch this. When we were children. What does that mean? Carnal. Well, before that, when they were children. It means that they were, back when they were carnal. Back whenever they were babes in Christ. Back whenever they took milk instead of meat. Right? Watch. He says, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Hear that? As long as you're a child, as long as you're carnal, as long as you're a babe in Christ, as long as you only hear the word and not become a doer of the word, you will be under bondage under the elements of the world. You know what that means? That means that whatever the world goes through, you're going to go through. The world is going to control you just like it controls unsaved people. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Right? That means that when, when you know, the pig flu comes around, then you're going to get it like everybody else. But if you're not under the bondage of the elements of the world, then that means when it comes on them, it's not going to get on you. You're going to go to them and get it off of them. Because it's, it now, it's, you see, you're no longer under its bondage. Now it's under your control. You understand? Because you grew up. <clears throat> I, I think I might have said this the other day, but the <clears throat> no spiritual person has ever died of sickness or disease. Right? Now I'm not saying no saved person. I'm not saying anybody that loves God. I mean, I'm not saying that. Right? I'm, I'm not talking about whether you love God or whether you're born again. I'm saying the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Right? So if a person dies... It means the carnal mind was in control to the point where if they, if they had sickness or disease, that got in because of the carnal mind. All right? All right, think about that, all right? Try to prove it wrong. You can't. I've tried myself. So I don't, I don't just spout this stuff out. Everything I tell you like that, I've already went through. I've already searched and tried to prove it wrong, couldn't. So then I've got to pass it on to you. <clears throat> but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now watch this, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Hear that? Did you hear what that said? Because... You are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Hear that? You're not a servant. You're a son. You're a son who serves. But there's a difference between a son who serves and a servant. Right? A servant doesn't know what his master does. A son does. A servant has to be told what to do, when to do, how to... Isn't that what it says over here in verse 1? Differs nothing from a servant, the child, the heir, even though he's Lord of all, he differs nothing from a servant. So it shows that as long as a child, the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, even though he's Lord of all, it means that he's not acting like Lord of all. And it means when he grows up and quits acting like a servant, he'll start acting like Lord of all. Servants have to ask, Lords of all, does it? You understand? Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Now, what, it, what he's saying is, you didn't know God, and, but you thought you were serving God. But in reality, you weren't serving God. You were serving demons that weren't God. But you thought you were serving God. 
You understand? See, once you get a picture of this, you start to realize devils don't care your intentions. They do not care. See, God looks on the heart. Devils try to push action. That's why somebody comes to me and goes, Oh, Brother Kirby, we've got to do this right now, and, and I need to know. What do you want us to do? You, but we've got to know right now. Do you want to do yes or no? I'm, automatically, my answer is going to be no. Right? Because when you move quick like that is when you make mistakes. The devil always tries to make you move quick. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't make you move quick at times, but I'm saying when someone tries to push you too quick, usually it ends up being a mistake. It's better to move slower. You say, well, what if we move slow and they die? Then you get to raise the dead. Okay? Don't worry about it. Just move on. God knows. I told, one time I had a problem because I always went to Walmart. I didn't really care for Kmart. I liked Walmart. Right? And I would always go to Walmart to pray for people. And somebody asked me, would you ever go to Kmart and pray for people? I guess I would. And then I started realizing it. And God really you know, started dealing with me. And I, and I started thinking about it more and more. And I thought, it really bothered me because I thought, well, what if there are people at Kmart that God has ordained? Because the Bible says they're that God has ordained. There are works that God has ordained us to walk in. Well, those works is healing and everything else. Well, what if some of my works that God ordained me to walk in, healing some people, what if those people are at Kmart instead of Walmart? Because I'm at Walmart. And if my four ordained works that I'm supposed to walk in, if they're over there at Kmart and I'm at Walmart, I'm not going to fulfill the works I'm supposed to be doing. And then I realized, God knows me. He knows where I'm going to be. And if those are my works, they'll be in Walmart. Right? Or, somehow, he'll get me to Kmart. Right? I may go to Walmart and walk in the restroom, and then when I walk out the restroom, I'm in Kmart. Right? You say, that sounds ridiculous. Well, well, then I won't expect to be hearing that testimony from you. Okay? But I know a guy that... I know of a guy... And that was doing that very thing. He was, he was praying. God kept telling him, you're, you're going to go to another country. And he said, God, I can't go to another country. I don't have a passport. I don't have money. I don't have any way to get there. And he said, pack your bag. Go to the airport. He said, God, I ain't going to do any good to go to the airport. I don't have a ticket. don't have money. don't have a passport. I don't have anything. I can't go. He said, pack your bag. Go to the airport. He packed his bag, one bag. Walked in. God, he said, well, what do I do now? God said, go to the bathroom. He said, God, I don't have to go to the bathroom. He said, go to the bathroom. <laughs> so he went to the bathroom, went to the stall, stood there for a second. He said, what do I do now? He said, go back out in the main area. He walked back out in the main area. He was in another country. Totally bypassed security. Totally bypassed, you know, all the stuff. To, which, <laughs> if I could bypass the loading, unloading, the carrying, the security, taking your shoes off and all, it'd be great, right? I'm, I'm, I'm heading for that one. Okay? I'm setting my faith to believe for that one. But he did that several times. Right now, down in uh, Mexico, David Hogan, a friend of mine, I don't know if you know of him or not, but if you don't, he's a wild man. He's something. <clears throat> and he's got a, a, a pastor that works for him. They've got about, well, well over 400 churches down there now. And he's got a pastor that works with him that every Sunday morning, this man, there's a, he has a church, he has an office, and the back, the, the door to his office is right behind the pulpit. And he walks out of that door, comes out, preaches. As soon as he's done preaching, then they have worship. He goes back to the door. When he walks through the door, when he walks through the door, on the other side, he walks out a door in another church six miles away. And he preaches there. They've been having worship. When he walks out the door, they let him preach. He walks back. He does that for six different churches. <laughs> six different churches. He does it six different churches every Sunday morning. He pastors six churches like that, and God transports him around. Every Sunday. Now, not everybody does that, but he does it. Right? But I guarantee you, when I get a chance to go down there, I'm going to go hang out with him. When he walks through that door, I'm right with him. You know? Okay? If I have to, I'll grab a hold of his belt loop or something. It's like, let's go. You know? But see, people say, well, that, that sounds crazy. Well, then I won't expect to be hearing that testimony from you. See, the whole purpose of testimony is to stretch you so you can start believing for it. Right? When you start understanding quantum physics, that doesn't sound near as impossible. Right? Same thing happened to Elijah. It's, it, come on, it's time for that stuff. Same thing happened to Philip. Isn't that right? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it was something like he was transported to something like 24, 27 miles, something like that. 
You see, there's all kinds of stuff that could happen like that. So, but at some point, let's see what it is. Remember I told you about that faith breaker? Well, we just hit that faith breaker with some of you. Right? So you got to exercise until you get your faith breaker bigger. Amen? All right. He said, now watch. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I'm emphasizing that for a reason. Now, let's, let's go over to Luke. Or actually, before we go there, go to 1 John. First John. Verse. Let's start at verse 15. First John 4 15, sorry. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. Is that what it says? Do you realize what that says? That says whatever Jesus is, that's what we are now in this world. You understand it? Now, it doesn't say as he is, so shall we be. Now, you believe the Bible or you don't? Which one is it? You believe it? As he is, so are we. See, like I said, you're going to have to realize that you have been, the Bible uses the term grafted, but I, I use the term melded. You've been, you've been assimilated by Jesus. You're not separate. That's why there's neither male nor female. You see? That's why it's not you anymore. It's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. You understand? So quit thinking of yourself. You know, like I said oh, so many times so far, my anointing, my gifting, my calling, my position, my, forget that. And just forget you. You know, forget yourself. Get yourself off your mind. Well, I want to pray for him, but I don't know if I have enough faith. That's because you're on your mind. Right? It's not about your faith. It's about their need. It's connecting their need with God's supply. It's not about you. You're just the conduit. You know, we, I hear all the time, well, you know, we're going to pray and we're going to, we're going to break open the heavens and we're going to have open heavens. Okay, the only problem with that is if there's a sinner sitting next to you, the heavens are closed to him. But they're open to you. So that means you're not going to open the heavens. And basically, if you're a Christian, the heaven, there's no closed heavens to a Christian. Okay, for, if, okay let, me, let me say it this way. If the heavens are closed to you, then what difference does it make? Because you're seated in heavenly places with him. If they shut the gates, you're inside. You understand? See, your problem is you focus too much on the here. Yeah, but I'm here. We're going to, you know, bombard the gates of heaven. Okay, first off, the gates are open. Right? The gates of heaven are open. And the Bible doesn't say anything that you bombard the gates of heaven. Matter of fact, it talks about that the gates of hell won't prevail against you. So maybe you need to turn your guns a different direction. <laughs> right? Come on, you start shooting at heaven, God might think you're on the wrong side. Right? But I hear the people talk, well, we just need an open heavens. You know, it's a brass heavens. It's a closed heavens. And I'm like, well, get saved. If, if you're saved, you are the conduit of heaven. Heaven can be closed to the sinner because they don't have a right to ask for anything. But you do. You're connected to heaven. You are heaven's conduit. No matter where you go, it's an open heaven. No matter where. You understand? You ain't got to get the heavens open. Come on. He's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He's already seated you in heavenly places with him. And come on. You know, all you got to do is start believing the Bible. Instead of the last book that came off the shelf down at the bookstore. Because all they're going to do is put out a sequel. Right? That's all they're doing. And you got to realize, you are who you need to be. You just need to start acting like it. 
When we get done, I'll, I'll, we're heading that direction. I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. And watch. He says, as, say that with, say it out loud. Because, because. As, he is, as he is, so are we, so are we. In, this in this world. Now, you believe that or not? All right, let's make it even more personal. Say it this way. We say, because, because as, he is, as he is, so am I. In this, world. in this world. Now that's who you are. Right? Yeah, let me let me take you to another one. Let's go to first John chapter three. <clears throat> Actually, go back up to first John chapter two, verse twenty. We'll start there and we'll run through this real quick. Verse twenty. First John chapter two, verse twenty. But you have an unction, that word is anointing in the Greek. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You say, I don't know all things. Yeah, you do. You just don't know you know them. Okay? Because that's because they're not here in your head. They're here. Right? Let me, let me explain. Okay, we talk about the backwards church. Right? Backwards church. Now, see, I get to do what Jesus did. It is wonderful. Jesus came along and they, he would say, You've heard it said, such and such. And then he'd say, But I say unto you. Isn't that right? Do you realize that's all I've done all week? That's all I've done. All I've done all week is say, you've heard it said. The church has taught you, or somebody taught you, or some, somehow you heard it said, but I say unto you. And then I get to do what Jesus said, and say, what, I, what do I say unto you? It is written. Isn't that, right? Isn't that all I've been doing? I say, you've heard this, but that's not true. Here's the truth. Matter of fact, here, let me prove it. Let me read it to you, and then I read it. Isn't that right? Isn't that the same thing? So all I'm doing is the ministry like Jesus did. That's all I'm doing. And the beauty of that is, you can do it too. Right? Because if you can read, you can do it. Right? Doesn't I don't have to remember a thing. I can, honestly, I could get up here and flip open the book somewhere in the New Testament and read it, read it to you and say, that's the truth. And you're right. Wouldn't have to remember a thing. Don't have to remember a certain doctrine. Don't, all I got to do is read it. Now, if you're going to go by a certain doctrine that's not in the Bible, you're going to have to remember a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> right? And you're going to have to remember, wait a minute, now what does our group say about that, the interpretation of that verse? Well, you don't need to do that. Just remember what the verse says. Right there, just read it out loud, okay? Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. You have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things. Oh, I was going to tell you about the backwards church. Remember I said, you've heard it said. Okay. And I've heard it said in churches all my life just about. Well, you know, yeah, I, I'm not walking everything I know. I mean, I have a lot of head knowledge, but it needs to become heart knowledge. You ever heard that before? Okay, that's a lie. That's a complete lie. You do not have head knowledge. It needs to become heart knowledge. Your heart was recreated. God recreated you, right? He did a good job. You were created complete and perfect in Him. Nothing needs to become heart knowledge. Actual, He says, your heart's been recreated. It's your mind that needs to be renewed. You don't have head knowledge that needs to become heart knowledge. You've got heart knowledge that needs to become head knowledge. But if you keep thinking, well, i got this knowledge, and sooner or later it's going to drop from here to here, and when it does, it's going to work. That is nowhere in the Bible. That is a complete lie. Nothing's going to drop from here to here. Right? It's got to go from here to here and out here. Amen? Isn't that simple? See, you've heard things about... How many of y'all heard teaching on Raymond and Logos? You heard that before? You know what I'm talking about? Like what you heard is wrong. I can guarantee it, okay? Because everything I've ever heard taught out there is wrong. And the thing is, just go back, get a, get a Greek concordance, look up the words. Right? The word Logos, if you look up Logos and Rhema, the definitions are almost identical. They are literally identical. And you can't tell the difference between the two by looking at them. But now, you look at certain verses, and it's pretty neat because all rhema is... Okay, logos, it says in James chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, right? When it says doers of the word, the word, word there is the Greek word logos. So you are to be doers of the Logos, not doers of the Rhema. But hadn't you always been taught, well, you can't just do the Logos. The Logos has to become Rhema. When it becomes Rhema, when God speaks a Rhema word to you, that's when you're supposed to do it. Isn't that right? Isn't that kind of the way you've heard Rhema and Logos taught? Well, I got news for you. Jane, well, the Bible has news for you. 
James 1.22 says, Be doers of the Logos. Not the rhema. Doesn't say anything about doing rhema. You're responsible for the Logos. The Logos is the written word of God, rightly divided. Right? That's all it is. And you are responsible for every word in this book done right. You're not, you're not responsible to sit and wait until God quickened. Well, God hadn't quickened that scripture to me. Oh, that's right. Let everybody go back. Point the finger at God. You didn't quicken, so I'm not responsible. You see? But the reality of it is this. You read where it says rhema, and if you understand the definition of rhema and what it actually is, you start reading through the verses, and every verse, it, it fits perfectly, and it works, and it's amazing. All rhema is, is a logos you do. When you do the Logos, when you do the written Word of God, rightly divided, the minute you do it, it becomes Rhema. Now, for instance, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, by every Rhema that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You say, wait a minute, didn't that, that say we should only do what God speaks? Well, no. First off, you don't live by every word in the Bible. Right? There's a whole lot of words in here that you're not doing. Isn't that right? But you do live by every word that you do. Right? In other words, the only laws you keep are the ones you keep. The laws you live by are the ones you keep. Isn't that right? You understand what I mean by that? If you don't keep a law, you don't live by that law. Okay. Well, then transfer that over to the Bible. The scriptures you keep are the ones, the ones you live by are the ones you keep. Right? The ones you do. If you lay hands on the sick, then you're keeping that scripture. You live by that scripture. Right? But if you don't do that scripture, you're not living by that scripture. You don't keep that. Isn't that right? So, man does not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, the word that he does, the logos that he does, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, the word, rhema, logos, has proceeded out of the mouth of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Then when you take that word spoken by God and you do it, then guess what? You're living by it. But until you do it, you're not living by it. So until you do it, it's not rhema that you're living by. Right? So forget that nonsense about God quickening the scripture to you and it becoming rhema. There's, God doesn't have two words. This is a logos word. This is a rhema word. This is what I want you to do. That one I just put in the book. I don't care if you do it or not. No, he didn't say that. Isn't it right? Matter of fact, if you go, you don't have to go there right now, but if you go, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 on, Jesus said, he, he said, if you hear my words and do them, then you're building your house on the rock. Right? The winds come, the rains come, the floods come, and all that stuff happens, and your house will stand. Right? Because your house is built on the rock. But if he that hears my words and does not do them, I will liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Right? The wind, you know, it's the same wind, same rain, same floods came. One man's house stood, the other man's house fell. The one that stood was the one that did the word. The one that fell was the one that didn't do the word. Now, he says, he that hears my words, my sayings. That word for, there for sayings is the Greek word legai, which comes from logos. He that hears the logos that I say and does them, he builds his house on a rock and his house will stand. He that hears the logos that I say and doesn't do it, his house will fall. That's what it's saying. You go through and look up every word where it talks about it. Okay? Matter of fact, it says in Mark chapter 4, the sower went forth to sow. And it said, the, and if you look at it from verse 14 on, it says that he, the sower, sows the word. And the word word is the word logos. And it said, the ones that the word profited, benefited, and the ones that didn't, didn't benefit. The logos benefited them. You're to be doers of the logos. When you do, okay, when you take food into your body, you put food in your mouth. The food, we call it food. When it goes into your body, what does your body do? Breaks it down, assimilates it, and turns it into what? Energy. Right? So really it's not the food you want, it's the energy that the food can produce. Right? Some foods are better and produces more energy. Some foods are not as good and don't produce as much energy. Right? Now, do you realize that 
If you put the food in your mouth and it doesn't and your body doesn't break it down and do something with it, what's it gonna do? Pass right through your body, and even though you eat, you will starve to death. Right? Why? Because you, you, your body, didn't do anything with the food. You took the food, you put it in your mouth, it passes through your body, and you can die of starvation because your body didn't break it down and do anything with it. The food did not become energy. Okay, Logos becomes Rhema when you do something with it. Now you can have Logos all you want and do nothing with it, and guess what? You can die because you're only a hearer and not a doer. But the minute you start doing the Logos, the Logos is transformed from word, from just the written word on the page, into the word that you live by. Right? So it's not two different words. Logos becomes Rhema. It's not food and energy. Food becomes energy. You get it? So all that nonsense you heard about Raymond clicking this and that, quickening and all that. Right? I got a CD back there. You can take it and listen to it. Get the scriptures. Go through it. Study it. Right? I don't tell you anything just for you to take my word. I, I hope you don't take my word for it. I hope you question it. I hope you go back in. You study it out. You look it up. I mean, I hope the statements I make just bother you so much you can't even sleep. And you get up and study the Bible instead. Amen? That's my goal. Amen? Because if I... See, I don't... I don't have to get you to believe me. But if I can get you to question what you believed in the past and you study the Bible, then you'll find the truth. Right? So the, the key is that you have enough gumption, as we'd say, or as the Bible would say, unction, to actually study it out and prove it. Now, if you're not going to do that and you're going to go tell a devil, well, I'm telling you to go like Brother Curry said to go. Well, then we'll hear stories about you getting chased down the street naked. Okay? <clears throat> so... Now, yeah. so go to we're at verse 20 run down to verse 27 but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you and you need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it has taught you you shall abide in him <clears throat> now I'm going to go ahead and read these other two just because you probably need to hear them and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And if we know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. All right? Now, forget the chapter division. Keep reading. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now you realize that's what got Jesus killed. Isn't that right? That's what got the Jews mad at him because he kept calling himself the son of God. And they said, you're calling yourself God. And they said, because when you call yourself the son of God, you make yourself out to be God. That's the way they saw it. And so they kept pushing until they had the Romans crucified. So when John wrote this, some of those people were still alive, I'm sure. And when he wrote this and said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He was taking his life in his hands knowing that, you know what? The Pharisees could bust in here and take me out and kill me over it. Because it was the same thing. But he still wrote it. And he said, Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. In other words, the world didn't understand Jesus. He was a son of God. And if we're sons of God, it's not going to understand us. If, it, if the world can understand you, guess what? You ain't looking enough like him yet. You ought to be looking enough like him where even, even if they don't understand you, they'll at least be coming and going, I don't get you, man. I just don't know how you do that. How did you do this? How did you do that? Now watch. He says, verse 2, Beloved, now, not someday, now are we the sons of God. Now watch this. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we sh when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And every man that has this hope in Him purifies himself. It doesn't say God purifies him. It says you purify yourself. Even as He is pure. 
And whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So whoever abides in him sins not. <clears throat> that means commits habitually. Doesn't mean doesn't make mistakes. But there's a big... Okay. Let me, let me explain what the difference between a mistake is. Okay? A mistake is saying something wrong or doing something... Oh, when you find out you've done it, it bothers you. Right? All right. Now, you didn't fall into sin. Right? You don't fall into sin. Before you sin, you've got to be tempted. So that means there was some premeditation to it. Right? You don't, you don't fall into adultery. It takes time to unbutton your clothes. Right? You, you, did, you didn't walk into that motel room and go, ah, how did I end up here? That ain't what happened. You planned it. Believe me, you have to plan that. Right? you got to make arrangements. And you've got to learn that that's going to cost you. When we talk about Samson here in a little bit, you're going to realize what sin costs. Even though God may use you, sin leaves its marks. And you may never truly achieve what God really wanted you to achieve if you keep playing with sin, even if God's using you while you're doing it. And if you can achieve so much with sin in your life, imagine what you can achieve without it. Amen? We'll see that in just a minute. Now I've got to read this real quick so we get there. Go back to that <clears throat> verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now you realize that... Now, listen carefully. I'm not trying to start a new doctrine or anything. I'm just trying to read the Bible. But I am trying to kind of shake you loose from some traditional thoughts and trying to make you... Because when you read that, you tend to think that you're going to be going along, he's going to appear, we're going to be changed into looking like him. Okay? Now, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that when he appears, mortality shall put on immortality. Corruption shall put on incorruption. Isn't that right? Now, it, it says that, watch this, it says, Now are we the sons of God, and it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but now we're the sons of God, right? But we know that when he appears, now I'm reading it exactly what it says, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, why do you be? Why do you put changed in there? You actually put in a couple of words: change to be. It does not say. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be changed to be like him. It doesn't say that. It says when he appears, you're going to be looking like him. It doesn't say he's going to show up and you're going to be changed to look like Jesus. It says he's not showing up till you're looking like him. Is that what it says? Now, you say, well, what about the, in the twinkling of an eye and the last trump and the, we're changing? Yeah, corruption will put on incorruption. Mortality will put on immortality. It does not say stupidity is going to put on brilliance. Right? Now, notice, remember, we, I just read you Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 said it's the duty of the fivefold ministry to grow you up into Him. Right? Now, it says here that now we're the sons of God. And it says that it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we're going to be like Him. Right? So that means that it, the fivefold ministry has got to do their job, get us looking like Him so He can show up. Because now we're the sons of God. Now we don't know what's gonna, what all is going to take place in the future, but we know this. Now we're just like Him. Because as He is, so are we in this world. See, you're waiting for Him to get here to change you to be like Him. And He's waiting on you to change to be like Him so He can get here. Come on, is this what it says? Hey, I don't like it any more than you do. I'd rather just hang out and hey, okay, God, whenever you're ready, just change us. Come on, show up. And you say, well, then that means we've got a lot of work to do before He gets back here. Well... I'm not saying everybody in church is going to be like him. Right? Because some people in church ain't even born again. But those that are born again, those that are of him, yeah, they're going to be changed to be like him. And they're going to walk like him and talk like him and act like him, be conformed to his image. See, all that's got to, all that's got to be done before he can show up because it's the five-fold ministry that's going to get us there. And the five-fold ministry, there's nothing in the New Testament about the five-fold ministry continuing in heaven. Are continuing after Jesus shows up. 
Nothing about that. Matter of fact, it says when he shows up, that's when, gonna, that's when all the works are going to stop. And he's going to give us our rewards because he's coming with it in his hand. So in other words, that's when it ends, not when it starts. Right? Just giving you something to think about. Right? But if you get a hold of this, you'll realize we've got to get busy. We've got some things to do. Right? We've got to love him, love our neighbor as ourselves, which means to do to them what we would have done to ourselves. And we've got to know him and make him known. Amen? And we've got to grow up. See, we, can't, we don't have the luxury of playing games and making this take forever. We've got to get this done. We've got, we don't have time to play games and watch stupid TV shows and waste all our time. And every time you watch one of those stupid TV shows that is anti-biblical, you say, well, it's just neutral. There is no neutral. Everything is either helping you renew your mind or it's helping unrenew your mind. And so if you're going to waste time you know, watching these stupid things that do nothing but you know, turn your brain to jelly, then it ain't going to do you any good to come to church on Sunday and hear... Okay, if you spend even an hour a night watching TV, right? Then that's five, six hours. You think you're going to undo that in an hour on Sunday? You ain't going to undo that. You know why? Because the hour on Sunday, you're going to be sitting there trying to stay awake or wondering if you turned off the stove or if you're burning the pot roast or whatever it is you're doing. And yet when you're watching the show, man, you're getting into it. And whenever you get into something, it sticks with you faster than if you don't get into it. You know, it would take me twice as long to do what we do, but you'd probably get it better if I just had you all stand up and repeat word for word everything I'm saying. Because you would remember it. Right? Or have you write it down and make sure you write it. Because you remember 70% of everything you write down. And if I could get you to write it and say it, and then, like tonight, get you to actually do it, man, you're there. Right? Because that's the way it is. But we, the more senses we can bring in to the situation, the faster you will absorb it and the faster it becomes a part of you. But if you just come in here and sit and listen and go home and watch 10 hours of TV, then you're undoing everything you learned. Amen? That's the way it works. So all I'm saying is, get serious. You know? That's, that's why, see, when I was talking to Michael Brown about fire school, and I asked him, I said, hey, have you ever thought about doing some things online, you know, some courses and stuff online? And kind of felt stupid after he gave me the answer, but he gave me a good answer. I said, he's, he's, somebody else said, no, they, they were talking about, not, you know, they weren't talking about doing anything like that. And I asked him, I said, why, why don't you think about doing some courses online? You know, because I live in Texas and it'd be kind of neat to be able to just go online and read some stuff. And I said, why don't you do some courses online? And he was sitting in the front seat and I was sitting over behind him. He turned around to me and goes, nobody joins the army through correspondence. And I thought, hmm, that was really good. <laughs> you know? But it's true. That's, that's why I tell people all the time. We're there in Dallas. We're going to start a Bible school there. I'm going to start the church back up. I'm setting up my time where I can be there more. And I, I put out the word all the time. And I tell you, if you're serious and you want to come to Dallas, you want to do something, you want to, you want to make something happen, you come down there. We'll, we'll put you in the school. We'll work with you. You go out on the field. You be in the church. You move there. You stay there. I will work with you. Now, I'm coming and going. But I'll tell you this. Here, here's the deal. I'm not just telling you to show up. All right? We have that happen all the time. Everybody shows up. Everybody says, God told me to come to work for you. And here's what I'm supposed to make. And I'm like, that's funny. He didn't mention you to me. I had one lady show up one time and said, uh, God told me to be your bus driver. I'm like, boy, that'll be great if I ever get a bus. Right? And the you know, single problem is that uh, you're a female and I'm a male, so that ain't going to work. Right? And so, but I t I'll tell you this. If you want to come to Dallas... I don't care who you are. don't care your age. don't care anything about that. You want to come to Dallas? You want to get in the Bible school? Fine. You want to work on the street? You want to build something? You want to do something? You want to make a difference? You come. But when you come, before you contact me and let me know you're there, you get a job, you get a house, you get a car. All right? Don't expect me to drive you around. Don't expect me to support you. All right? And don't expect to sleep in my garage. Right? We get that all the time. Okay? You come there, you get set up, and you say, but, but I don't want to work, I want to study. Or, see, that's the problem. I have preached and worked. I have worked to provide money for me to go preach. 
And when you're serious enough about the message that you will work to help promote the message, then you're serious. Until then, you're just freeloader. You're looking for a way to get God to support you. Right? Well, I'm living by faith. No, you're living by Curry's faith. You're wanting Curry to bring in the money. You understand? Now, I, you know. So, you want to come? Come. But get set up. Don't come there and come call me and tell me you're, you know, at the bus station waiting for me to come pick you up. Because okay? I can promise you, all, if I do this, this will be all I would do. I would come and possibly buy you a ticket back home. Maybe. Okay? If I answer my phone. Right? Because I, I screen all my calls. And if I hear you, I may not even call you back. Right? I ain't responsible for you. This, my job is this. Right? To teach you to do it, get you to do it, and take away every excuse for you not doing it. And if you... So when I get done here, I'm, I'm done. You know what I'm saying? As far as my, my responsibility. But now if you want to work and you want to do something and you need help, I'm available. Emails, phone calls, I will help you and I'll work with you if you're serious. Right? And you want to come to Dallas? Come on, because we're going to do something. Right? It's going to be neat. But we need people that are serious, not flakes, not people that are looking for a free ride. Amen? We need people to help do something, not detract from something. Amen? Okay. We're going to have to send you to break as I keep talking. <clears throat> now, where are we at here? Yeah. Da -da -da -da. We'll come back to that. Okay? Take a break. Let's do that. I don't want to get back in this again. Don't forget where we are, though. Don't forget.